Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending. I've got some notes for uh, the moderator. Um, we've got exit doors at the back of the room. Um, if you would, silence your phones. If you need to take a call, take it. No issues there. Um, to all of our sponsors, thank you, whoever they are. Um, it says here that uh, all of the sessions will be available on video free of charge to all attendees. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll answer your questions as we go through. Uh, but please wait for the microphone because these sessions are being recorded. We want your question asked into the microphone. Please speak slowly so other folks can hear your question. And then I'll give you the, the best answer I've got. And if I can't answer your question, I'll get the information to get back to you. All right. <clears throat> So my information is up on the screen. Um, on the last slide will be my email address. It's joshua.blockberger at va.gov. I work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, just a brief history about me. I grew up in, in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, Northwest Arkansas is famous for Walmarts and Tyson chickens. Uh, those were my career opportunities. Um, I decided to go to college, so I joined the Army, enlisted in 1986, and uh, medically retired in 2001. Um, for those of you with military service, uh, I went in as an E-1, and uh, when I got my blue card, uh, I was the Director of Intelligence Requirements for Tommy Franks at US CENTCOM, um, completed college and transitioned over to the Commission Branch. So, after I left the Army, in 2001, uh, I opened a business. I sold stocks, bonds, mutual funds, insurance, banking, investments, uh, and I made uh, what's called a lot of money. Um, and then 9-11 happened. Um, wanted to give a little bit back to my country because uh, literally I had enough money to take care of me. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office was looking for an anti-terrorism advisor, and that's pretty much what I did on active duty. Uh, so I went down through my resume in with 68,000 other individuals. Um, the U.S. Attorney hired me. I spent two years working with local, state, and federal agencies on the terrorism threat in America. Uh, I was recruited by the FBI to run national security programs. I spent eight years with the FBI um, doing FBI stuff and then had to make a decision, move to Washington, D.C. Uh, or stay in Arkansas, which is home for me. Um, and uh, for those of you that understand faith, I wanted to stay home, and I wanted a promotion, and I let it go. And the VA created a director's job in North Little Rock, Arkansas, 22 miles from my house. I didn't move to Washington, D.C., and I got the promotion I was looking for. So I've been with the VA for about six years. Uh, wonderful position for me. Um, and the FBI was running seven different functional security programs as a chief security officer. Um, I was also an inspector running around the country helping other divisions. Uh, with the Department of Veterans Affairs, um, I run one program, it's personnel security. Um, and uh, the, the fun part of this position is uh, I'm a franchise fund, uh, which means I can do fee for service. Uh, I do it within the, the Department of Veterans Affairs at 176 hospitals. There are about 500 veteran offices that contract with us, uh, National Cemetery Association. We run all the contractor investigations. So if you're a contractor, you get a contract with the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, get my email address. Um, you'll need to work with your core, uh, but you're free to call me with any questions. All right. Um, just as an aside, two years ago, the Department, uh, no, Transportation Security Agency uh, had a backlog of about 100,000 frequent flyer known traveler number investigations. Um, we contracted with TSA, did those background investigations, and reduced their backlog in about four months. Um, so for government agencies, if we can help you uh, with anything, just let us know. Um, so what we do in personnel security is about trust. We want to make sure that uh, contractors or employees, you are who you say you are, and you're the kind of person that uh, we want on our team. 
And if you're not, we'll be very polite. You will have due process. Uh, you will be able to explain yourself. Uh, if it's explained and mitigated, that's fine. Uh, if not, then uh, the opportunity will be closed. HSPD 12 um, in the FICAM concept has identity credential access management. Uh, background investigation is what facilitates the ID card, the access uh, to information or facilities. All right. Um, I don't see a, a laser pointer here. So on the top is identity management. Uh, you're all familiar with the I-9 form uh, with multiple uh, types of identification. You'll have to bring those in. Be fingerprinted. Uh, demonstrate that you are who you say you are. In the VA, we run you against 17 different uh, national databases to make sure you're not on a watch list. Um, and then we ask you to fill out the uh, background investigation, whether it's uh, low level tier one, or uh, a tier five for top secret. Um, we run all of those investigations. So, regulatory information, uh, executive orders um, for suitability, CFR 731, 32, and 36. Um, within the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, Directive 6500. Uh, is on the IT side. Uh, it says that if anyone has logical access into our computer systems, they have to have a background investigation according to HSPD 12. <clears throat> the Directive 710 covers all of our personnel security requirements, and there's a small portion in there on information security. Um, and then HSPD 12 uh, requires uh, a tier one level investigation. We used to call those NACIs or NACI. Um, before issued a PIV badge. On the DOD side, it's called a CAC card, um, but we're not integrated and we have a PIV card. This is really just history. HSPD 12 came in to being in 2004. We were all part of it. The VA said in 2012, everybody in the department is gonna get on board. We are there now. Um, in 0735 is HSPD 12 documentation inside the department. Uh, in OPM, uh, they have a position designation automated tool. Uh, it's pronounced PDAT if you like pronouncing acronyms. But what that tool does is it looks at the individual contract requirements and the individual contract officer uh, or an HR officer. We'll fill that form out, determine the level of su su suitability, whether it's tier one, which is a low level, moderate risk, tier two. I used to be at an MBI, uh, minimum background investigation. Uh, you can see the examples up there. And then tier four, high risk background investigation uh, are for those who have access to networks, money, fiduciary responsibilities, police chiefs. Um, It's a program that we worked through our department to make sure that everyone had the background investigation. Uh, the first time that Chris Pitt within the Department of Veterans Affairs was 2012. Again, that goes back to the HSPD 12 uh, port when the department said we're stopping allowing folks to get in without a, a, a PIV card. Everybody want, must have one. So we had CRISP um, and that year I think we did 4,000 uh, investigations. Uh, folks that had low level uh, and needed moderate or high risk investigations. So the investigative requirements, the risk levels across the, the top, moving from left to right. There's tier one, tier two, and tier four. These are on suitability. Um, there's suitability and national security. So this is access to information or facilities without the requirement or need for a national security secret or top secret investigation. Okay. So on a low risk tier one, there is no investigation or no interview required. Um, most of these go out and mail outs, uh, checks employment, education, whether you've been arrested for the last three years, 
or you've lived for the last three years, there's no credit check and there's no reinvestigation requirement. So a tier one investigation, once that's cleared, if you stay on the contract or stay in employment, you don't need another one unless your investigation level changes. Uh, tier two, moderate risk. Uh, an interview is required. It looks at employment uh, back five years with education and law enforcement checks, residence again for three years, does have credit checks and every five years reinvestigation. And then there's no change for the high risk. It just looks at uh, a little more deeply than if there is an issue um, that might get a pass in a moderate risk, it'll have to be mitigated on the high risk. So what we're looking at in a background investigation, and these will be on a form known as the 85 or 85P. Um, 86 is for national security, and we'll cover that in a slide later. Um, but what we're looking for is any misconduct or negligence employment that is germane or relative to the contract or the employment position that you're applying for. Right. Uh, criminal dishonest conduct, uh, material intentional false statement or deception. Um, let me assume that uh, everyone has had a background investigation, right? And, and if you have not had a background investigation done by the federal government, uh, I'll tell you that uh, everyone has a life. Some people's lives are far more colorful than others. Uh, when you go to fill out the 85, 85P or SF86 questionnaire, uh, if it asks a question, my advice to you is answer honestly. An investigator may come out and ask you several questions about something you're not comfortable with. But as long as you're honest in the answering, then there may be a way to mitigate uh, that answer and still get you the background investigation. Uh, candor is an issue. So if you lie or if you forgot or if you didn't remember it and you marked no and it should have been a yes, that's probably going to be a disqualifier um, that will prevent you from being hired or getting the contract. Right. Uh, refusal to furnish testimony um, as required. Um, you know, if there's a question asked and you say, no, I don't want to put that answer there because my attorney said I didn't have to, that's fine. You and your attorney can find you a job because you're not going to make it through the background investigation process unless you answer all of the questions asked. Um, alcohol abuse, uh, we're looking there for any direct threat of property or safety, abuse issues, um, illegal use of drugs and narcotics. Um, for your uh, employees, if you have a contract company, uh, there are many, many states around the country now where marijuana use is legal. Okay. Uh, if you get a federal contract, it's not legal in the federal system. Right? So you need to tell your employees did they, they stopped, um, you know, if, unless they want to continue using marijuana and that's okay. Um, but marijuana is still illegal in the federal system. You cannot use it and be on contract or be an employee, even if the state within which you reside uses legal. Uh, knowing and willful engagement acts or activities to overthrow the United States government. Those would be discriminators uh, that would prevent you from receiving a background investigation favorably. So adjudication, what we're looking at is uh, whether the person's employment is going to promote the efficiency and effectiveness uh, of the service of the federal government. Um, uh, on the third bullet down, it talks about risk level of the position, whether it's a low risk, medium risk, or high risk. Um, the higher the level of public risk, the more serious any issue becomes. Um, and then again, whether it's within nexus uh, or it's germane, say it as an example, an individual uh, was embezzling money from a, a company uh, and they're fired um, and then they apply to a federal position as an accountant, that would be direct nexus um, and that would be a, a significant issue. Um, law enforcement or being a federal employee using illegal drugs on the job of put public trust uh, would be nexus. Special agreement checks, 
We call them SACs. This is the fingerprint check. Um, within the Department of Veterans Affairs, if the contract position is less than six months, and the only thing is required is the fingerprint check. Again, we run those fingerprints against 17 different national databases. Um, if the contract exceeds six months or requires access to information or facilities, you may still require uh, a full uh, tier one, two or four investigation. All right. We have individuals without compensation, uh, student trainees, work study, uh, partnership acts, et cetera. Uh, those individuals uh, have very limited, no access to computers or uh, restricted space areas, uh, so they don't require a background investigation beyond the fingerprints. Uh, medical, dental residents, less than one year continuous service, uh, and then volunteers uh, that work at the information booths, uh, just a fingerprint check only. So here's our process, um, pre-contract hiring. Uh, if you've got a company and you anticipate a contract award, uh, you're going to have a stated uh, contract officer representative get in touch with them as quickly as possible. That we call it a core. Core is responsible for facilitating all the information uh, into my office for your employees. All right. Again, at the end of this, you'll have my uh, contact information again. Uh, please contact me immediately. Um, I'll get you with uh, one of our teams uh, and get you the information so you can fill out all the forms required and get that to the core and streamline your process to getting on the contract and getting to work. All right. The VA initiates uh, employees and does all of that information. The core or the contract office representative does that for contract companies. And again, they send that to, uh, to my office, which is in North Little Rock, Arkansas. All right. Once we run about five quality reviews to make sure all of your information on your employees is correct, we send that out to OPM. OPM does the shoe leather investigation on the street if required, conducts the interviews, compiles the reports, sends that back to North Little Rock uh, for adjudication and final determination. Um, so how long does it take? All I can tell you is history. Um, in OPM statistics for 2017, um, in my office for low risk and moderate to high risk, uh, we were just under seven days for getting all the paperwork through, reviewing all the EQIP questionnaires, making sure everything was uh, ready to go to OPM, uh, and then we sent it off. MBIB, the National Background Investigation Bureau, that's what OPM is called today. Uh, on a low-risk investigation was 100 days last year and 279 days for Tier 2 and Tier 4. All right. Once the investigation paperwork came back, um, about five business days is what it takes to receive the case material, review it, and get it back. Uh, the good news is um, if you've got a contract employee coming in, once the fingerprints are done and the questionnaire is completed for OPM, and your case is scheduled um, when the Department of Veterans Affairs, we will authorize the issuance of a PIV card so you can go to work. All right. So we try to get you to work generally within the first week. Does that make sense? So here's some of the issues that may pop up. Um, your employee is not completing uh, all of the forms. Um, on the sec third bullet down off of the right, 501-257-4469 or 4490. That's a direct number into my help desk. Uh, got an experienced staff there that will answer any and all questions. Uh, typically it's, I forgot my password, I forgot my golden questions, and they can't log into eQuip. Um, but if there's a problem with uh, the various forms that are, must be filled at the tier two or tier four level, um, 306 or, or 710 form in our department. Um, if there's information that's not clear, it's handwritten and we need a clarification on that, um, we may contact you and that'll be the number you use to get those papers correct uh, so we get it into OPM. 
uh, MBIB or OPM will reject an application uh, for a background investigation because a form is not clear. All right. um, if you have a, a, an employee that has a previous investigation um, that's still within what we call scope, uh, then we will look at that investigation for reciprocity, um, order the case, review it. We can generally get that done in a couple of days. And that investigation is still good, then it's still good. All right, so we're gonna try to get your employees to work as quickly as possible. And the bottom line is, is just a, a reminder again that uh, our policy is to get contract employees to work as quickly as possible. So once you've completed the equip uh, for OPM, done your fingerprints, uh, we're going to get you into working uh, a day or two or three or four. It really depends on how quick your employees get the papers back to us. So how do you make this process quicker for your company so you can start generating the those, uh, those revenues, all right? When you get your contract, uh, personally call me or have your HR office uh, give me a call, all right? We get all the forms to them. They can never, they can't send the forms to me because there's uh, PII, uh, name, date of birth, place of birth, social security number, et cetera, all right? All of the forms and the information has to go to the contract officer and then that's digitally submitted, uh, encrypted uh, to my office. All right. But I will front load you with everything that I can to make your job and my job as easy as possible. Okay. Let me see here. What you can expect from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, the VA contract office representative uh, is going to work with your company uh, to get your employees um, to work as quickly as possible. Uh, timely adjudication of the special agreement checks, uh, and those again are fingerprints. So the fingerprints are done digitally, uh, sent to OPM, then the report is sent back uh, either to the hospital where your prints were taken or to my office. Uh, it depends on the routing. Um, it's reviewed, we make the adjudication, submit the reports back to OPM, uh, and that takes about 24 to 48 hours for that process to happen. And once that process is done, so within about two days, we can authorize the uh, go ahead for HSPD 12 and the PIV card. All right. Timely review and release of scheduling investigation with OPM. Again, we, last year we were able to do that in less than seven working days, uh, getting your people to work with physical and logical access as quickly as possible. And then after the investigation is completed by uh, NBIB and uh, we get the report, we're gonna review that typically happens in about seven to 10 working days. Uh, and then the contract office representative will get the final notification. Um, it's not gonna be sent out to the, uh, the contract company, but we will get that report back out to let you know that the investigation was good. Um, so what happens if the investigation has an issue? All right, uh, if an investigation has an issue, uh, someone will contact the, the employee um, as a hypothetical, um, I live in Colorado and I smoke marijuana is, is an answer we'll see. Well, it's a federal contract. Marijuana is legal in, in Colorado, but it's not federally legal. Okay, uh, so that's an issue. It's an illegal drug as far as the federal government's concerned. Um, we would send a, 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 it's called a proposed action letter, a PAL. Uh, out to the employee, uh, telling them that they're using illegal drugs and this is not suitable for federal employment or on the contract, and we'd ask them to explain themselves. And they have an opportunity to explain themselves. When the answer comes back, we review that. If it's mitigated, fine. We'll give a letter of warning. Uh, if it's not mitigated, then we give a final action letter uh, and we tell the, uh, the contract office representative that this specific contract employee is no longer fit for the, this contract. Now, we also get a letter to the contract company at this time telling you that there is nothing unsuitable about your employee with your company. Uh, that's not what we're saying. We're just saying that for this contract, there was some issue um, that that individual is not suitable for. So at the bottom is my email address. 
And you had the help desk numbers, and I think this is the last slide. Um, so any questions that you might have regarding personnel security, I'll answer. Any other questions? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a microphone coming to you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have a question. Um, I work out of um, a contracting office in um, Milwaukee, and we do a lot of um, locum contracts. Mm -hmm. So we have physicians that are moving from various locations, some VA, non-VA, then back to VA. So what is, is there a time frame that they could be off of a VA contract and come back without having to go through the full-blown background investigation process? Yeah, it, it'll be a case by case, right? But typically we look at 24 months um, of being in scope. Um, and because they're contract employees, um, what I would recommend you do is just call the help desk at the SIC, the Security Investigation Center in North Little Rock. Did you get that number? Yes. Okay, yeah, just call the help desk down there or send me an email. Um, and, and I'll get you the answer. Um, I'll need to do it encrypted because I'll need name, date of birth, place over, or, and social. Okay. Um, if they've been on a VA contract before, they should be in the database right. um, at the SIC because you know, for the last many, many decades, um, since 2009, we've had the database in place, so we've captured all of those. Uh, in the next months, um, VA cabs will be coming online uh, and that database migration will be over and over you'll have access within your hospital uh, to that information. Do we have to request that? Um, Do you have access to it or? It'll be available in the HR office. Um, if, are, are you a core? No, I'm a CO. A CO? You probably will not have access, uh, but there'll be someone in your HR office with access. No, I actually have access to the HR suitability Right. Database. Right. So is that kind of like the right. same thing? It, well, it's going to be nationwide for the VA. Okay. okay. Um, but since all contractors come through the SIC, uh, just call the help desk and they'll take care of you. Okay. Um, and, and if they've got an investigation that's within scope, we'll get the reciprocity done in a couple of days. Okay. Okay. Yes. Anything else? No, I think that's it. We, we do a lot of work with your office and we, we get really good service. Thank you. And um, our only real issue is the timeliness that the, the contractor, contract employees respond back with the paperwork. Right. And a lot of times we don't get it back. Right. And then the, the process has to start over. Mm -hmm. So for, if they're contractors here, that's, that's one of our major things is keep starting over. Yeah, and that's critical. And, and I understand that everyone is very busy, uh, especially your clinicians. They're very busy people uh, and they need to see patients all day long. And then after they have seen the patients, then they've got to do notes and everything else. Um, but if you could stress to them, they've got to find some time. Um, I just did my background on reinvestigation personally. Um, it was about a month ago. Uh, and now I'm a tier five high risk investigation because I have access to everybody's information. It took me less than two hours to complete that. Um, so if you will tell them they need to find it about two hours, because you know, they're looking back three, five or seven, maybe 10 years for clinicians, it's probably seven years on residences and they know where they lived, all right? Um, for everybody else, I'll, I'll tell you an aside story. Um, when I was working in another federal agency, um, it was time for a reinvestigation of an employee and they didn't fill out the questionnaire, didn't fill out the questionnaire. And inside our agency, if you didn't fill out the questionnaire by the deadline, we literally turned off your computer access and, and you, you became functionally unemployed. And then you had to go to a senior executive explain why you were not doing your job and then bring his permission slip back down to get the computer to turn back on. So it was a very, very big deal. So this individual's secondary investigation in the same agency uh, had been at that workplace for eight years, all right, and was just totally stressed out. 
Um, is there anyone not done a federal background investigation in the audience? Everybody has? Okay, except for you. All right, so we've got some really strict questions. What is your name, last name, first name, middle name? What is your date of birth? What is your place of birth, city and state, or foreign country? What is your social security number? Where did you go to school? Where did you go to work for the last 10 years? You know, where was your last diploma? Anybody stressed out yet? Everybody know all the answers? Okay. So then, and then there's some other questions. Have you ever been arrested? Have you been married? Have you been divorced? And, and these are the type of trick questions that people really get stressed out of. Okay. I mean, stressed out. Um, so back to my story. I went to this individual. I said, hey, let's just sit down, take a few minutes, and we're going to go through this questionnaire. And he knew his name. He knew his birth date. He knew his wife's name. He knew his kids' names. He knew where he went to college. He knew where he worked for the last 10 years. And in about 35 minutes, we had it all filled out, and he hit the go button, and he was done. All right. What I don't know and what you don't know is what else is going on in your employees' lives. And sometimes taking the time to fill out those questionnaires is just too much for them. All right. So leverage, leverage your HR office, uh, leverage somebody in your company, um, someone to go with that physician to sit with them, you know, if possible, uh, to get that filled out. Because you know, they don't know what they don't know and, and there are no trick questions, you know all the answers. And again, answer all the questions honestly. If it's honestly answered, uh, then someone may be able to work with you to mitigate whatever obstacles in front of that question. Um, and, and, and we're trying to get folks to work who are honest. Folks that are not honest, um, well, you can't trust them, right? Are there any other questions? Now, Neil, what time is it? They gave me an hour. All right, so I've used 32 of your minutes. So you all get an hour's worth of CPEs.